here with us, I promise. And I'm going to need us to sit over here today so we can see the screen, okay? We're going to sit right here on this, yes, right on this step so we can see the screen. Lyric is here. Here comes Annie. Come on down. Yes. It's good to see you. Praise God. Nana, you guys have to come down. Your dad's the star of this children's message. I, I did tell Michael in advance that he would be seen on the screen today during the children's message. Come on down. Well, I am so excited because you guys have been doing such, oh, come on, yeah, 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 yeah. You guys have been doing such a great job saying, uh, going around on the third Sunday of the month and collecting your orange feather money, you know, you go around and get, it's not that day today, by the way, it's the third Sunday. But I just wanted to tell you how the first quarter has gone. Now, a quarter is one-fourth of something. We know that from money, right? Qu four quarters in a dollar, and there's four quarters uh, in the year. So the first three months is the first quarter, okay? So the first quarter, are you ready for this? You guys normally collect like mm, maybe $100, maybe $150. The first quarter of this year, you have collected $1,500. That's amazing. And not only that, but our friend, friends from Orange Feather Community School in Ghana have sent us some pictures and some videos so we can see some of the things that are happening in the life of the school. And I'm going to kind of narrate that as we see which one comes up first, and we're going to just freeze. Well, okay, look. Do you recognize that guy? Look right there. Yeah, that's, my dad. that's your dad. I know. When he went home, when he went home for your uh, for your grandpa's funeral, he went to the Orange Feather Community School, and looks like he's enjoying a Fanta there. And he is looking at some of the construction in the backyard in the in the playground. Let's see what's next. Is it a video or a picture? There's there's your dad and and Frank. Remember, Frank came and spoke to us. And can you see all that grass? Uh, that, that, that grass in those tubes, that's the playground where they can crawl over things and crawl through. It's really cool. We're going to see a video of it being made in just a second. All right, keep going. Here, well, there's an excited young lady. I don't know if we have sound for her. All right, wait, wait, wait. What are those, what is, they're, they're tongue twisters, but what is the real name for that? Alliteration. S she did the sea, she sells seashells by the seashore, the pickled pepper one, and then she did the woodchuck, woodchuck could, right? All right, let's see what the next, is. are there more? That's it? Okay, so the playground is being built. And I got this letter from, uh, from the board of directors, and look at this. A young lady made a picture for us, and it's watercolor, and it says, thank you. And this is from, I'm not sure I know how to say her name, Yovella. And she's four years old, and she goes to the Orange Feather Community School. And then the last thing is we have this for our church. This is a plaque that the Orange Feather Community School sent to us, and Michael brought it home from Ghana with him, and he almost left it in the airport in Atlanta. So it's a blessing from God that this has made it to us. Uh, and we are just so thankful for that. And guess what? It starts with you. Because you're going around and collecting these, these coins, and I'll leave this here if anybody wants to look at it after worship. You're going around and collecting that money, and you're giving your best puppy dog eyes to folks so that they put that money in that bucket. And you have already raised $1,500, and that playground looks great, and the kids are working hard every day, and they know that you are here working for them, and they are so thankful. It's easy to remember to say thank you when we get something great, right? 
When you get a present, it's easy to remember to say thank you. When you get candy, it's easy to remember to say thank you. But when the gift that we are getting, which is this new playground and new books and all these new things for the school, uh, is 4,000 miles away, sometimes it's hard to be excited by the thank you. But I want you to be excited. And I want you all, are you ready? We're going to turn and say thank you to them for helping us with their monies. Ready? One, two, three. Because we are so excited that this project is going good, and you've now seen some of your friends and what's happening in Ghana, and maybe someday we're going to go there, and I, I'm going to go back there, and Michael will go back there to his homeland, and we'll take some people from this church to go and do some work there, and maybe you'll come with us someday, okay? But you are doing good things. God sees it. These folks see it, and these kids see it, and they've written you a note and everything, so... It's important to, to remember to say thank you. It's important to be thankful when we receive a thank you instead of a, a gift. And it's important to continue to do the good work, okay? Let, and you guys are going to go with Grammy Sammy, and Jordan's already back there. So uh, let's go ahead and pray. And you can repeat after me, because that's how you know, Grammy Sammy knew where it does it for you. Dear Lord, thank you for letting us help our friends at Orange Feather School. Help us to continue to be excited to help others. Thank you for your son, Jesus. It is in his name we pray. Amen. All right, I'll see you guys next time. All right, here we go. There is nothing more pure than when a child has that moment of excitement and recognition. And when praise God looked up and said, that's my dad! <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was that pure look. That was that moment when he realized uh, something in his life was, was, was taking place right here in front of the church. Well, this morning, this morning uh, we begin a five-week series called Making an Impact. And this series is one that I came up with after spending uh, time at the Cove, the Billy Graham Retreat Center, up uh, kind of between Montreat and uh, Asheville. It's literally, uh, you get off the, the, one of the exits, and if you turn right, you go into town, and if you turn left, you start to the gate of the Billy Graham Giant Complex. And I really enjoy going there. And uh, I'm so thankful that there's been money put aside by this church for pastors to go there and spend time in relaxing and in prayer and with colleagues and with world-class uh, pastors and biblical scholars and musicians. You, you just never know when you're there uh, who's going to come out and speak or they'll say, well, you know, uh, we, this, this musician was in town, so he thought he'd drop by tonight and play a few songs with us before we get involved in our lecture, and then like Stephen Curtis Chapman walks out or something. It's, it's like crazy, the, the kind of people that they, uh, they get there. And uh, this past time, I was there with a pastor named Chip Ingram. He was our lead speaker, and um, he's from a you know, he, he led a mega church in California. He, he took a church in, in Dallas or, or somewhere in Texas that was like 25 people and bleeding out like $30,000 a month and turned it into thousands of people. Now, that's not what we're up to, so don't get worried. Um, I'm, I'm not, I mean, if God wants that for us, then that's what's going to happen. But, but that's not the, the, the source or the, the, the meaning behind this series. Um, my, my trip, in fact, my trip to that, that lecture that week yielded two series, and the first will be this one, and then the second will be a summer series, kind of uh, after my travel uh, time period, a late summer series that will be uh, hopefully meaningful as well. And for the first, next five weeks, uh, we are going to make our way through Ephesians chapter 4. Now, you might be thinking, uh oh and I kind of was too, because I really hope my parents are not watching this live stream today, because when I was a kid, 
Uh, in the 1980s, we attended a now defunct church called South Hills Reformed Presbyterian Church. And we met in a grade school for a number of years and just met in classrooms and in the auditorium. And then later, uh, we decided to build a building and we would go out there to this property every single uh, Saturday. All the people of the church would go there and work. Uh, we had the building constructed but not finished. So uh, the electrical work was done, uh, but, and it, so it was basically bare drywall and concrete floors. So we laid all the carpeting, like did all the finish work, all the painting. And we also did, and I may have talked about this another time, we did an omni stone driveway. So we had more money than cents, I think. So the end of those, those interlocking bricks, and we did the driveway and the, the parking lot. And we paid for the company to do the driveway because that had to be structurally sound and, you know, had to function like a road. But the parking lot, the men of the church did themselves. And my brother and I took an old metal wagon, and not a, you know, not a plastic wagon, but an old metal wagon. It was probably my father's. And it, was, it was big. I mean, three kids could sit in it. And we put as many bricks as we could carry in that wagon and dragged them to wherever the men were working. And I wish I had a time machine to go back and see how painfully slow that process must have been. Laying those omni stones, one wagon load at a time. I don't even really know how the process worked. I imagine they put down some sort of something in the bottom to level it out. And, and they must have gotten them close to level, but they couldn't, surely couldn't have leveled every single one to perfection. It was a parking lot after all. So anyway, uh, this is the church. And the pastor's name was Arnie Frank, and he was a, a very orthodox older guy. I actually looked him up, and he only died in like 2015, somewhere in his 90s. Um, and he went through Ephesians chapter 4. And this is why, or excuse me, all of Ephesians. And this is why I said my, my parents would be having heart attacks. Because he would do a verse a week for like three and a half years. And I remember us preaching on Ephesians 4 on Christmas Eve. I mean, the birth of Christ, forget it. We're in Ephesians 4, verse 6. Let's keep rolling. And he, he went on and on and on and on and on. So here I am 35 years later, channeling him, I guess, because this chapter is um, one of the most meaningful chapters in all of the New Testament. And it's my hope that this month, this will help us to know what it means to be a church that matters, a church that makes an impact for Christ. So let's listen now. We're going to just read the first few verses today, and then we'll make our way through it. However, I would like to challenge you, consider, if you are looking for something to do in your personal study time, consider one time a week this, this month reading all of Ephesians chapter 4. It will not take you five minutes. Just read through it. If you are in our Life Center study and you want to read it in your newly found Lectio Divina way, you know, in your contemplative, prayerful reading of Scripture, maybe you'll get something out of that too. But anyhow, uh, we're going to read the first seven verses, and I would challenge you to read the whole thing each week as we go through it. Lord God, open our hearts and minds to this, your word. Help us to understand the message you have for us this day. Help us as we embark on this journey together to be your faithful people in this place. And help us to want to draw closer to you and impact this world for you. And help us to understand what that could look like. It is in the name of your son we pray. Amen. Did you hear that click? That was water bottle on tooth. Huh. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 
Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, as I look back on my childhood and as I think about my brother and I joking and picking fun at going to church and saying, I wonder what the preacher's going to preach on today, uh, for most of our early teen years, I have to admit that old Pastor Frank was not wrong. Uh, Chip Ingram at my retreat argues that Ephesians chapter 4 is one of, if not the most important chapters of the New Testament for Christian life. That is to say that once someone has accepted Christ, accepts the truth that Jesus uh, is critical to their life, is the author of their salvation, that this chapter is critical in how we are to live a faithful, productive, and blessed life in Christ. And over these weeks, we're going to look at what it means to have an impact for Christ, to be transformed by the Spirit. Next week, actually, we're going to look at the obstacles to our impact, what keeps us from uh, uh, going out and bearing fruit. Now, this does not mean, uh, I I mean, we're going to talk about real concrete things, like the obstacles that get in our paths each and every day. The clear impact that Christ had in his time on earth, and then we'll look at our our impact as individuals and our impact as as a community of faith. So that's the end goal, is to see how um, we as a community of faith can, can grow and lead and share. And this passage kind of starts by asking us, um, what is our calling? And the answer to that question is to walk a life worthy of our calling. To walk a life worthy of the gift that we've been given to us by God, right? Worthy of the gift that God has given us in his son, Jesus Christ. And Paul tells us in the opening of this chapter that we are to live this life worthy of a calling that we've received. And he calls himself a prisoner. Now, he was, in fact, possibly imprisoned at this time. But this doesn't, he's not talking about being in jail. He's talking about being a prisoner to Christ. It mean, it, meaning that he is bound to Christ. He is obligated to Christ. He is locked down for Jesus in his heart and in his soul and in his mind. And I think we resist this. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, Paul tells us that we are to have our eyes enlightened to the hope to which we are called. We're called to a hope in Jesus, friends. And that hope calls us into action. I think uh, for us as mainline, uh, low-pressure middle-of-the-road, denominational Christians in America, we see accepting Christ as the end of the journey. And maybe we do a good thing from time to time. But what, at whatever point in our lives we uh, ask Jesus into our hearts or we recognize that there's something to this Jesus thing and we think we're good, that's it. We've completed what we need to complete. And now we can... Uh, when, when, it, when it hits the fan or when we die, we are covered. We have the insurance policy. Uh, we can put it in the safe and relax and enjoy. We can enjoy life, maybe throw a, a, a hey, I'm sorry, God, up there every once in a while when we know we've done wrong, and we just kind of go on down the road. And that is partially accurate. We are set. We can't lose our salvation. But We aren't given that gift like it's some old sweater that we feel comfortable in, but we would never wear it out in public. Do you have that sweater? Or that top, that that house coat my grandmother used to call it, right? That that, that item, um, I have a sweater in my office that uh, is kind of a Mr. Rogers sweater. It's got all kinds of stripes on it. And I put it on when it's freezing in the office or when it's freezing outside regardless of uh, what it matches or doesn't match. And I don't let anyone see it. If someone comes to the office and and Jen says, hey, this person's here to see you, I'll take it off and hang it back up because it is old and mangy and really cheap. And it just doesn't, it's, uh, it's really out there. 
And you'll never find it in my office if you go looking for it, so don't even bother. But I think that's what we can do with our faith. We put it on to stay warm. We put it on when times are tough. We put it on when we need to feel the arms of love around us, but we would never wear it out in public. We are private about it, and that's just who we are. That's why we're Presbyterians, after all. And that's just it. But we are called to use it, to share it, and to grow it so that we can draw closer to God. We're not called to a private personal, we are called to have a personal relationship with him, but that personal relationship is to blossom with us into more. And this chapter, I have to admit, is hard for me right from the beginning because Paul wants to establish the cornerstones by which we can um, set out to do this work. He calls for us to be humble, gentle, and patient in our dealings with one another. Humble, gentle, and and patient. None of these would be used to describe me in a sentence. Now, that doesn't mean I'm mean or you know, anything like that. He calls for us to bear with one another in love. Here again, I don't bear well with others. But you know what? As I read these traits this week, I realize that these are the exact same traits that we see the most mentioned or lifted up as characteristics when we talk about Jesus in his earthly life. That's who he was. Let's talk about the first one, humility. Lowliness of mind, the, este the esteeming ourselves as small. The correct estimate of ourselves, maybe that's the safest and simplest way to talk about humility. The correct estimate of ourselves, and I think most of us, for most of the day, have no problem with this. But then we have these moments, and some of us, more than others, have other moments when we, we, we think higher of ourselves, and we, we get our nose out of joint because we, don't, we, we, we aren't recognized as, as the person of, of position that we, are, we think we deserve to be recognized as. Um, I remember as a, as a collegiate rugby player, they would make all of the freshmen pick up and carry all the equipment off the field. Now, rugby was not a big, powerful, well, it is a big, powerful sport, but a big, powerful sport in the university sense, I mean, that we had to set up our own goalposts and paint our own field and do all these things before we could play a game, right? And I remember being so frustrated being asked to carry a bag of balls off the field at the end of the game. I just scored the winning score, and you want me to carry a bag of balls off the field. That is not humility. Knowing our position and understanding who we are in Christ. Gentleness or meekness. And this is not only in our outward behavior but in, or in our relationship to one another, but just our natural disposition. It's an an inward grace of the soul, I guess, is a, a neat way to think about that. And we need to think about how we can do this toward God as well. You know, we think about, well, if I'm nice to this person, everything's fine. But what this really means is our ability to approach God in the right way. Patience. We've called that long-suffering when we went through the fruits of the Spirit, right? The willingness to endure and this is self-restraint before proceeding to action. This is the one I struggle with the most. If I had an ounce of patience, I probably would have back two or three days of my life in the hours I have spent writing apology emails or clarification emails or let's clean this up emails or saying I'm sorry or going to Costco to buy flowers or all the things that I've had to do in life because I am not patient and I don't have self-restraint. And then finally, the last one, bearing with one another in love, to endure with one another, to tolerate one another, to hold back, or to hold up. These are the cornerstones that Paul wants for us to have if we're going to make an impact. These are the things that we have to be aware of, or self-aware, maybe more appropriately, if we are to have an impact. 
And this is an important thing for us to realize that as we look at to be transformed as individuals or as couples or as families or as a community of faith, that this can only happen with Christ at the core. Literally, if we had someone holding us back on a leash, that would not be without Christ. We would not have a, the source of self-control that we need. You know, I have decided, I've been doing some exercising, and I've been trying to include walking, and one of the things, um, I, I've, I've started, we have the little dog, we have small, medium, and large now, right? S- small, medium, maybe 40 pounds, he's a doodle of some sort, he's, but with some herding dog in him, so it's, it's, he's an Aussie doodle, so he wants, he's, he's got the poodle stuff going on, but he's also wants to be on your leg herding you. And then we have the big old dog, but he's got a bad knee, so he doesn't walk. So I walk the medium and the large, or the small. And I walk them one in each hand, and this one just wants to walk along and look and watch the world go by. And this one doesn't want to walk. He wants to sniff. And so I walk like this, ready? All day through the neighborhood. So yesterday I decided today is the day this ends. Now these dogs are both on harnesses. So I have some control over them. They are perfect when other dogs pass us going the other way. But I don't like walking like this. I'm not walking in a, you know, holding hands in a, 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 merry go, a, a here we go around the mulberry bush song or anything like this. I want to walk like a normal person. So I started to yank this dog. I yanked him so much that the harness almost came off. I yanked him so much that he got terrified. So guess what he did? Stayed further back. I finally realized about a mile into our walk that the best way for him to walk right beside me and do the exact thing I wanted him to do was just ignore him. Was just let him think he was in control. Let him, he likes to feel his, his, his hip on my leg so that he can feel like he's hurting me and keeping me safe. I probably would have skinned that dog had God not intervened and given me the spirit of patience, right? People driving by probably thought I was insane as this giant curly dog that has been shaved down because he has so many uh, mats to shave out and he still has foofy ears and no tail is walk, hopping along on two feet because I'm trying to get him to walk next to me. But we're the same way. Without the Lord, we're never going to get it. And God doesn't want to parade us on a leash. But in some ways, from this world, we have to be broken to be faithful servants of Jesus Christ. No job, no amount of money, no perfect partner, nothing will move the needle in our lives. It's only Christ. This passage is about God's grace, and that's what we're to be anchored in. Ephesians has already made the astounding claim that God chose us not only before we did anything to deserve it or even desire it, but before the creation of the world. That's Ephesians 1.4 that tells us that. And... The life which we are to live is a response, and it's to be worthy. And that's from our first verse. We are called to bind ourselves to God and to live a life that is not only worthy, but that bears fruit. And that's the journey that we'll look at over this next month. How do we bind ourselves to Christ in a meaningful, lasting, and life-changing way? We're called to make an impact. As those bound to God, we should long to share the gift we've received with others. We should long to make the world a better place in Him. And sadly, we allow life and what the world tells us to slip into the thin space between us and the Spirit and that bond of peace. This week, as we begin this journey together, may we remember Paul's call to be humble and gentle and patient as we begin this journey together. We will talk specifically next week about the obstacles that keep us from making an impact for Christ. It may actually be wrong to call them obstacles because we tend to avoid obstacles in the road, right? If we see a big pothole, we go around it. 
And I think that, as we'll see next week, we hold on as tightly as we can to these obstacles of this world that keep us from being transformed. So I invite you to join me next week to find out. Are you an old sweater Christian? Or are you ready to make an impact for Jesus? Let's find out together. Let's pray together. Lord God, open our hearts and minds to this, your word, that we might be the people you are calling us to be. Help us to be willing to step out in faith to serve you and help us to be gentle and humble and kind and bearing with one another in love. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.